Hello there. I'm joined by Jade Light from the Jade Light YouTube channel today. Uh, he's host of the Jaded Talk uh, podcast series of streams reviewing the expanded universe with five picoseconds, uh, which is a, a great series, uh, unless you're Kevin J. Anderson. <laughs> and uh, J Jade's been on the channel before a long, long while ago. He was on a live stream. Uh, I'm very excited to have him back to talk about uh, the Star Wars Expanding Universe today. Uh, first of all, how are you? And uh, thank you for joining us. Hello, Brennan. Thanks for your kind words. And I'm doing just fine. Nice, lovely Saturday afternoon. Nice. Well, glad to have you on today. Uh, and uh, I, I really like the podcast. Um, and uh, yeah, keep up the good work. You and Pico are... Uh, a fun duo to listen to as you're going through some of this stuff. Thank you. Thank you. The first question uh, that uh, kind of starts off is a, is a very obvious one. And that's uh, what's your first memory of star Wars? How did you get into uh, the star Wars universe? So the definitive like first memory I have, that's kind of hazy because I was definitely like, a very young child when I first came into contact with Star Wars in any way. Um, the first memory I do have are the movies. So it's just going to be the movies, um, all six of them. So the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy. And yeah, I guess I, I watched the OT a bit before the prequels. The prequels were kind of coming out as I was, you know, born or as I was like a toddler. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That, that, that's basically it. the movies and then like slowly mostly video games I think in my childhood because I I was big in, into like video games as a kid so w these were Star Wars video games then oh yeah so I, I think the first Star Wars video game I had was oh god it was Lego Star Wars the original trilogy for nice PlayStation yeah. 2. um then we also had the complete saga for was Nintendo DS, I think. Um, Force Unleashed 1 and 2, of course, were amongst them. And then, yeah, later, as I started becoming a teenager, I mostly played SOTOR. So not KOTOR, sadly. I will <laughs> I will catch up to them at some point. But <laughs> um, Star Wars The Old Republic, that was, like, probably what I sunk most hours into, well, because of, you know, the game design, I guess, it being an MMORPG. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, of, of those first movies that you watched, uh, do you have favorites? How do the original trilogy and prequel trilogy stack up for you? So my definitive favorite, and it's kind of been my favorite movie just in general for a long time, is Return of the Jedi. Nice. It's, I, I would be ready to accept that it might be the weakest of the OT movies. It's always kind of difficult to debate them but I, I think return of the jedi being the weakest is kind of accepted upon by most people yeah. but just the you know the the emotional climax you know the the solution mm -hmm. of the luke vader storyline everything just coming together at the end in a big happy ending that's usually my favorite part of like any book trilogy movie trilogy that's why let's say return of the king is also my favorite lord of the rings movie and yeah that that one's like definitive number one. Then it would be, you know, Empire, New Hope. Uh, I'm always jumping in between, uh, you know, Attack of the Clones or uh, Revenge of the Sith as the favorite prequel movie. Uh, most people don't like Attack of the Clones, and I, I get it. I just kind of like it because there's much more of Christopher Lee, I feel like, in that movie. And yeah. He, he uh, sadly stole the show, sadly, because he wasn't that much in those movies uh, in the first place. And yeah, I guess bottom of all six of them would be Phantom Menace. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I even enjoy that movie. Like, I'm not that picky about them, but definitely uh, a bigger OT guy than the prequels. Nice. It's It sounds like our lists compare quite a bit. I. I definitely think that Return of the Jedi might be the weakest, but it's, you know, sentimental favorite, like you yeah. said, with the uh, payoffs. And mm -hmm. glad to hear some Attack of the Clones appreciation because, <laughs> yeah, th there's a lot of hatred for that one uh, in the fandom sometimes. 
yeah, it's a, it's just a personal thing. I usually don't like like sad endings or like tragic endings. And of course, Revenge of the Sith is supposed to be that because how else are you gonna go into the OT? Um, the good stuff I really, really love. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I don't know. I enjoyed it, and I'm gonna enjoy it to this day. But same for all of the prequel movies, really. That's awesome. Uh, so as you'd gone through these movies, uh, were the video games like uh, pretty much there since the start? Uh, were, were you playing the Star Wars video games around the time you watched the movies just a couple of years later? Uh, and were you excited to find out that Star Wars uh, was available via other media? Yeah, so it the, the movies definitely were like significantly before the games but then again like my first console was the ps2 and i got it when i was around i think like maybe eight years old or something or seven i'm not quite sure and yeah lego star wars was like very early on in my purchase history so i i was excited but then again i was i was a kid so i guess i didn't think too much about star wars in you know in that conscious way i was like hey I love Star Wars. There's a video game. That's it, really. That was all my, that was my yeah. entire thought process. So, um, yeah, but but I I was very happy, of course, with uh, being able to explore more Star Wars stories in general just via video games because, um, yeah, it was probably my favorite medium at the time. So that was cool. That's awesome. Uh, and then beyond that, there's uh the expanding universe, and there's all of these books and comics. Uh. In addition to the video games, uh, when did you start to get into uh, the quite large uh, expanded universe? Yeah, so that's also kind of tough to pinpoint, at least like the very beginning. Yeah. I guess if you go per definition, TCW would have been it because it basically came out, I think, like one or two years. I'm not quite sure after it aired in the US. So like, you know late aughts early tens of um of 2000 you know so somewhere around that time i guess on, on paper and when i started playing uh, force unleashed but um if it's actually about you know books and comics uh, as a child i remember um i was a lot on jedipedia which is essentially just german wikipedia yeah and i just you know i just searched for i don't know luke skywalker or something and i read like you know the article on luke skywalker and there was a, a lot of these things, these information. I'm like, where, the, like, where's that from? This sounds cool. Like, oh, cool. Luke Skywalker has a, he has a wife and he has a son. I'm like, where's that from? I never, I never saw that in the movie. And the thing is, I was so young, probably at that point, that I never realized I could just scroll down, go to the sources, uh, <laughs> you know, to the sources tab, and see like, oh, there's books listed there as the source. That's probably it. No, I was just kind of <laughs> ignorant <laughs> about of that fact. And so I never realized it for most of my childhood. And the time when I really got actually into it was like early to, uh, 2020. It was mm -hmm. around the time when I first watched um, Rise of Skywalker and all the others. Like I didn't watch any of the sequels basically until Rise of Skywalker came out. And, you know, I, I was like, eh okay I, i'm not really into this and uh, my best friend at the time i was like still in high school or like no very early out of high school um his favorite character was um, palpatine so what he recommended me to read was uh, plagueis so plagueis is actually the very first book nice. that i've ever read of course i was in love with it because it's a fantastic book and i just asked him like hey you, you've got anything else his other favorite character was Thrawn, and that's how I then uh, read the Thrawn trilogy, the regular one. And from that point, I just I guess I kind of went on Reddit, searched for information, and that's how I got into like you know buying more books, reading more of them, and just jumping into the universe as a whole. So early 2020 would be the answer. That's really really cool. Uh, we talked a bit beforehand about sort of. Uh... The potential for a, a language barrier and a different Star Wars experience for uh, 
people in foreign countries uh, to, to the U.S., non-English speaking countries. Uh, and we talked a bit about uh, like if, if it was harder to get into Star Wars because of that or if it didn't really make a difference. Uh, and it sounded like uh, it, it really wasn't a problem, but but it did mean that you kind of experience these characters in a different way. Yeah, so if there's a country where you're not going to have these problems a lot and it's not English speaking, then it's got to be Germany because um, Germany usually with all like even semi big movie releases, video game releases like nowadays and also back in the day, it always like made an effort to translate a lot for some reason. I mean, there's enough native Eng uh, German speakers, but I'm always kind of surprised by how much we translate. And it's the same with the EU. Um, so the problem that you are going to run into is that a lot of editions of books that you're going to find are going to be like actual first prints from the 90s that got translated once and then never again. That's, you know, what, what I mentioned before is you can actually see that if you go to, if you flip the book and look at the back of it, um, you're going to see the prices listed there. And if it's actually a new book, new meaning past like 2000, 2001, the price is going to be listed in euros because that's when the euro was introduced in Germany and everything before that has Deutsche Mark, so German Mark, the, the old currency. And that's when, when you're like, oh, damn, the, this book, like the actual edition that I'm holding in my hand is is older than I am. <laughs> kind of crazy to think about. Um, but yeah, all adult novels, a lot of the YA stuff, uh, basically all of the comics, most of the comics have been translated to German and are more or less available. Like the amount of books that still get regularly reprinted is like that. that's very slim. You don't have a lot of them which do get that treatment, but most of them are relatively easily available as used copies and also in pretty good condition most of the times. Um, yeah, so Germany is definitely better off um, for non native English speakers. I've, you know, there's other countries I know, like from Sweden, you have like a handful of books that got translated and most of them haven't, um, that's not a problem in Germany. So do you know how uh, accurate or how uh, considered to be good uh, the translations are? Like, uh, do, do people who have read both uh, consider uh, both uh, uh, the German translation to be a pretty solid translation of the books? Oh, yeah, there, there are some, um, especially in like Bantam era books, there's a lot of weird uh, translations that aren't that aren't really accurate. They aren't even always that accurate with the movie. So what you have is the emperor, the, the correct like translation for emperor um, from the movie would be imperator, which sounds like basically like the English word. Um, but sometimes it has been translated as Kaiser. So just like the normal historical translation gotcha. of the word emperor. Yeah. Um, so that's always been a thing that, that that hasn't happened too much. It's I think famously in a New Hope still uh, that they say Kaiser instead of Imperator, and yes, some words just uh, don't really make a lot of sense. So uh, let's say Rogue Squadron. Famously, um, the the correct translation would be Renegatenstaffel. That's like what you usually see, but. Um, in those like Bantam books, especially in the Rogue Squadron books themselves, they're just called Sonderstaffel, which means like like special squadron or something. <laughs> Doesn't sound all that impressive. It sounds more like uh, you know, like spe it sounds like special needs people, which you know, not to it me that doesn't offense, but it doesn't sound intimidating for a, a, a pilot squadron. <laughs> no, or um, Grand Moff. I don't know why, but that's a that, that's a word that hasn't been translated well a lot of times. So Grossmoff, that's the correct translation, and it sounds very much like the English word. But sometimes it's been translated as Grossmufti. And I don't know why, because <laughs> Mufti, that's like it's like an Islamic title for like a I, I know like an Islamic prayer person or something, like a, a person of authority. So I never understood why that was the translation. <laughs> it made no sense to me. But other than that, 
most of the time it's like pretty accurate and it doesn't sound weird or off when you read it lightsaber that's always a thing that's sometimes you know doesn't make a lot of sense in translation but yeah i think usually the translations are very high quality yeah do you think it uh only got better over time uh because it sounds like some of the some of the uh perhaps errors or stuff that didn't sound quite right were some of the older stuff oh definitely yeah i would say that they got just polished over time because uh, i don't know maybe communication with the original authors or like however that worked i'm of course not quite sure but yeah de definitely there's this like there's a significant improvement over time yeah it's mostly those 90s bantam books kind of where you have these weird words that you don't quite understand you're like there's an easier more fitting word that sounds better um th that's that hasn't been that much of an issue in like you know after 2000 books so yeah definitely they have been approved that's really awesome uh it's it's awesome that uh you know the full catalog really is over uh out there as well yeah uh, that's just phenomenal i'm glad that they did a good job uh in translating and stuff like that for uh the german audience of star wars fans but we also talked about uh kind of the german dub and that mm -hmm. the voice actors are different uh kind of obviously uh, in the dub than uh the voices for the original trilogy prequel trilogy actors and stuff and yep. they kind of retained continuity by bringing those voice actors back, uh, is what you had been saying uh, before the stream. So, uh, what what's uh, what's that like uh, to have to have uh, not the not the same voices as uh, in the English uh, versions of the Star Wars films? Yeah, of course. To me, the default voices are the German ones because. Um, they are the voices that I'm that I was used to as a child that I'm still used to today. They are what brought me into Star Wars, if you want to you know, say it like that. And uh, it's definitely nice because, you know, as I said, translation is usually very high quality and the same goes for voice acting. German voice acting is usually um, very nice. Uh, so it's def it was definitely a cool experience to have the German voices in all of the movies uh whether that's the ot the prequels even later when i watched tcw you know i, I mentioned that I, I wouldn't like you know definitively claim which voice actors were taken from the prequels into tcw but it's definitely a, a noticeable amount of them definitely i think that anakin and obi-wan are identical um i think even count dooku and mace windu but i, I wouldn't like uh, you know, bet money on it that that, that that's the actual uh, the actual same voice actors but they sound very similar and it is nice because it even though i'm not the biggest fan of tcw today maybe it makes just the experience of watching it a bit more believable because you yeah. recognize the voices that you hear and yeah it, it's definitely nice and it makes it funny sometimes when you hear the english voices which of course for english-speaking audiences are the definitive ones like uh, James Earl Jones as Darth Vader. Of course, he has a great voice and he pers uh, perfectly personified Vader. But of course, the, the German voice is just that that's what I'm used to. That's what I grew up with. And that's always going to be my definitive Darth Vader, I would say. Would you say the voices are overall pretty comparable? I think so. I'd, I'd have to like sit down and listen to, you know, scenes in, in German and English parallel to really make a definitive claim about that but i would say i think that the intonation the general just voice matches pretty well yeah so there's no like uh really crazy standouts that just uh, sound completely different or anything like that it's all pretty one-to-one -one, you'd say yeah the, the crazy standouts you'll you'll usually have mm -hmm. if you have other foreign voice actors which maybe aren't that high quality or aren't you know used to translating so many movies that's when you sometimes get very very weird <laughs> voices where like okay that doesn't even sound remotely like you'd imagine the character to sound yeah uh, for for german voice acting i would say that's really really high up there and it doesn't sound weird to me of course um 
it might sound weird to Americans like listen to it to the, for the first time, but I think um, I think you can get used to them very easily. And I'd argue some scenes work better even with with yeah. a more harsh sounding language like German. Um, famously, like one of the scenes people point to is uh, you know, Palpatine proclaiming the Empire in Revenge <laughs> of the Sith because I mean it's a big. Yeah massive state speech about uh, toppling the Republic. Uh, maybe that's a meme that German would sound nice with that. Or like, <laughs> uh, you know, General Hux from The Force Awakens. I mean, I'm not oh, a big yeah. fan of, of the movies, but it's it fits perfectly and everyone, make, everyone makes fun of it, but it, it sounds more believable almost, I would say. Um, <laughs> then again, native German speaker, so yeah. Yeah. Uh... As, as you'd been going into Star Wars, uh, you mentioned the Force Unleashed video games. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on those? Uh, has it changed? Has it evolved since since you played it as a kid? Uh, a lot of people point to some of the stuff there as kind of pretty unbelievable lore. Uh, but, you know, I, they're really fun games in my opinion. Uh, what, what did you think of them? I think fun, they're definitely fun. I, I don't even think anyone argues that necessarily. Uh, I have also read a lot of the, you know, uh, criticisms about just, I guess, the story, the character of Gal Merrick, of course. And from the general silliness aspect, I'd say I agree. Then again, I'd have to, you know, revisit the story because it's been like 10 years probably that I've played those games. I haven't read the books yet, so I have basically no recollection of the details from them. Um, if it's about like silliness in video games, specifically when it you know, ties back to the EU, I'm always a bit more careful for dismissing anything. Not necessarily because it can't be silly, but more so because I always think a, a lot of logic has to be just... It, it doesn't have to be, that's wrong, but it, a lot of logic just gets turned off kind of to make a an enjoyable video game experience, I'd say. So like famously the the mission on, oh God, was it Rexus Prime or something, where Gal Merrick pulls down an entire Star Destroyer? Yeah. Of course, yep. that's stupid. If you just look at the scene that way, and you're like, this one guy can can pull an entire Star Destroyer into the planet and <laughs> you know, also like break its fall so that he doesn't get crushed by it. But um, I, I never want to like apply, I guess, video game logic to a book universe because i'm like the fact that this character gets like resurrected when you die also suspends <laughs> logic in a way you know like of, yeah of course that doesn't mean gal Merrick is actually invincible because he never dies he just uh, respawns so I'd, I'd have to read the books because if it's about story i'd have to say the books have to be like the definitive version where you like read the logic out of it and the video game is just maybe a an overdone visual representation of that and yeah. it's gonna look weird in a lot of ways it doesn't have to but that's the way they chose to do it and i don't mind them too much yeah so then as you've been going through uh the books beyond that you mentioned that uh you you really like plagueis uh, mm -hmm. which was your first read uh yeah. does it does it remain pretty high up uh in the expanded universe books you've read so far which which would you point to as a handful of standouts or favorites? A handful of standouts, yeah. So Plagueis, I would still say, just from a pure like writing quality and, of course, connections, because that's James Lucino's big thing. He can connect to all of these little pieces of information which seem unimportant if you look at them the first time, and then you're like, oh, all of this ties back into this, this, and that, like, the fact that Plagueis, the character, was alive for most of Phantom Menace when I found yes. out about that, I was, like, I had my mind blown. And I mean, Same. yeah, it, it doesn't. Like, now, if you think about it, it's like, yeah, I mean, that 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 could have happened. Why why not? But when I experienced it for the first time, it was crazy. Kind of like, oh damn, it was around all the time, and we didn't know in the movie. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it it definitely remains up there, like very very high in my list. I guess it just. Um, I always say it like that when I kind of think about what is my favorite book. 
is um, the it's of course important in which era is the book playing. Uh, I like, I mean, the book is great, but I don't care that much, let's say, about the prequel era than the post Return of the Jedi era. And then it also has to, you know, uh, deal with characters I like most, which in my case are mostly the big three, the big three movie characters and Mara Jade. And it has to do them, like, you know, most justice. So my, like, noticeable, like, very um, fav favorite books would be Vision of the Future right now. That's my favorite book in the EU so far because nice. uh, to me it was a very nice way to kind of reframe a lot of the problems I had with other Bantam books. It's, a, uh, I would say, very satisfying conclusion to just the Galactic Civil War as a whole. Uh, the Empire as a villain faction kind of just... It, you know, it was played out at that point. Like, there's not a lot new things you can do other than new warlord or new super weapon. It's, at some point, you've told the story and you need to move on. And I, I like the way that this book handled it. Uh, another honorable mention that was basically my favorite book until I've read Vision of the Future is Met Star 2. Um, Met Star in general is a fantastic duology. I, I recommend everyone reading it. Of course, everyone would say read all the other Matt Reeves books before. I think uh, the Darth Maul Shadowhunter, right? That yeah. came beforehand. Uh, but I read it, you know, as my first Matt Reeves books, and they, they are they are fantastic. I didn't think I'd care about Barris Offee as a character. Me neither. Yeah, it's like it's it's this weird character I only know basically from TCW before because yeah, of course, and I didn't expect to be invested in her at all. Um, the the surgeon, I think uh, Joss Vondar was his name, and yep. Tolk Latren, which was his nurse, like the, his assistant, basically. I very much liked them um, because they kind of were the more you know, centerpiece of the story. Barris Offy was kind of just... She was kind of a main character, but also kind of not, you know what I mean? It, it felt like yeah. she was always more of a side character compared to the two of them. Mm -hmm. to Joss. So that's a Big, you know, big story right up there. It's uh, it's like about you know about just a general war scenario. Like, you know, they are fighting over these supposed resources for like uh, I think drugs was the purpose, and then in the end, it's like oh damn, all of this uh, is not like it seems. Uh, and uh, in the end, and yep. as emotional high points, I, everyone should read it. And yeah, I guess I have a lot books that I just generally love kenobi the last command uh, i jedi but yeah I, I think the ones that are like really noteworthy th those are the ones let's say Matt star 2 and vision of the future just because those were the two i considered my uh, favorite novels for a long time or still do that's awesome so would you say that the expanding universe then is an overall uh net positive experience so far uh in your journey I would say so. I mean, for people who do know me, I'm known for having strong opinions, whether I really like or really dislike something. I have a strong opinion about it. And of course, I've yet to read all of the EU, but I would definitely say like, as a as a whole, I think probably the worst and the best of Star Wars, I think, is in the EU because <laughs> it's just th there's so many different things, like very different um kinds of stories and experiences that you get to make and you're bound to find something that you detest and you're bound to find something that you love and so far even though i you know as i said famously dislike a lot of them uh, i i would definitely say yes net positive so maybe the high points uh, outweigh some of the low points for you oh yeah definitely i mean e even though i really i really dislike some low points uh yeah, the high points in general, just the the overall experience, I would say, definitively positive. No, no question. Yeah. You mentioned uh, that Mara Jade was a character that uh, is important to you for when she's explored well in mm -hmm. these books. Would would you point to her as maybe your favorite of uh, the original characters to the expanding universe? Uh, are there others that rank up there for you? Yeah, basically, until I knew of the existence of Mara Jade. 
um, Han Solo was my my all time favorite Star Wars character, just in general, nice. and also probably my favorite character. Period. And 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 then when I started reading the EU, basically from her first appearance in uh, Heirs, uh, Heir to the Empire, I I was hooked on her character. I thought uh, she was very entertaining to read. I thought she had great um, chemistry with Luke, and it made for fun interactions. And yeah, definitively out of all the EU original characters, she's my favorite character. And I would even say that at this point, even though Han Solo is always like a, a centerpiece of me because uh, I love him so much from the movies, I would say she's just also my favorite Star Wars character at this point because when she's well done, she's very enjoyable to read. And yeah, she kind of trumps uh, everyone else in that regard for me. That's awesome. Uh, now, as a big Han fan, Mm -hmm. How well do you think uh, Han is written within the expanded universe? I had always found that uh, I thought Han was really incredibly written most of the time. Like I could hear the lines as his lines. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do, you, do you think there are a lot of good writers of Han or, or are there any bad writers of Han uh, that are out there as well? How do you think his writing as a character uh, works within the expanded universe? I'd say mostly probably still positive um if i think about like books that i've read in in all five zan books in which he appears like um you know throne trilogy hand of throne duology, duology i would say he's uh, well written probably like the most like different aspects to him would be in the han solo trilogy by ac crispin um i definitely think he's fantastically written there and his like the way that he turns out as a character, especially right at the end of the third book, is very mm. believable. And you get a feeling of why he even has the feelings and um, you know the emotions that he has in the beginning of the movie. And yeah, the, the Brian Daly Han Solo books, I would say, is also... It, it's a bit more simple, maybe, because you don't explore a lot of his, I guess, character motivations. It's just yeah. like... This is a uh, this is Han as you know him. He kind of behaves the way that you expect him to, and it's just a story, like in basically a, a frozen moment. It's like, yeah, there's a story. He does the things you expect him to do, and that's well done. But it's not like he goes through some dramatic changes or something. Um, yeah, and yeah, in general, I would still say he's well written. The problem, I guess, so far, I can only make claims about the Bantam era because I haven't read beyond that, is that it, it always goes kind of back and forth, I guess, with, with how the public perceives Han as like a hero of the New Republic. Like, because sometimes you get this feeling of people don't forget about Han's past. They, they yeah. still think of him as this smuggler criminal who will, like, who will uh, sell out the New Republic for a dime. But then also if he goes back to being the big hero again. It's always, it, to me, it felt like, especially in the middle part of the Anthem era, that it 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 felt a very inconsistent. But if you look at like the good, I would say, interpretations of his character, I think they're very consistent and they work very well. And if you have those in mind, then yeah, you'll definitely enjoy them as a Han Solo fan. Nice. Now... Within the Star Wars Expanded Universe, uh, you have a favorite author, and his name is uh, Kevin J. Anderson. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. How have your experiences with Mr. Anderson's books uh, been? I, I know extremely positive. <laughs> uh, okay, what can I say? So my first Kevin J. Anderson novel was Jedi Search, because um, in, in the beginning phases of the EU, I just kind of jumped back and forth in the timeline to read books like where i saw the story outline and i'm like hey that sounds interesting i'm gonna read that or i don't i i like han solo i'm gonna read the essay crispin books um and at some point i was like okay my goal is to read new jedi order that's like the the, the series i want to reach at some point but i want to read all these books at least once so i'm like okay we have the bantam era here i might as well you know, pick a point where I'm going to start from and then just go through it. Yeah. And 
I think it was like around the time I finished the mm, I finished Courtship of Princess Leia probably then I'm like okay I'll just read through everything now in chronological order and yeah so Jedi Search was the first one and yeah I how, how can I say I had my my big problems with uh, <laughs> with that book and it kind of just continued onward so Jedi Search I was already not really enjoying a lot and everyone said like you know I, I guess people who generally also are not a big fan of Kevin J. Anderson <laughs> but like of the Jedi Academy trilogy Jedi Search is the best one so buckle up I'm like oh god okay, <laughs> I'm gonna see and yeah um as we talked about before I read a Firestorm I think immediately afterwards and I unironically love the um the shorts so it's a short story of course and from the yeah, uh, adventure journal with Tion is the main character. Exactly, exactly. And that was also the first time I already got confused because in Jedi Search, like you read about you know blob races and Hans going to Kessel, and you're like, where's the Jedi Academy exactly? Because <laughs> as far as yeah. I remember, in the first book, you really only get to learn about two of uh, the future apprentices, which would be Gantorus and stream like the, they are the ones that luke seeks out in the in that book and that's it and then you read about that short story where he finds tion and i'm like why isn't this in the novel like this is because the name is jedi academy trilogy so you know it, it kind of advertises and like promises a specific kind of story that i don't think the story that was told really you know fulfills and so I was like, I love this. This is great, but why isn't this in the book? That's where it belonged. And you know, then I read Dark Apprentice. I read uh, Champions of the Force. I, I really, really disliked what I read, uh, which probably is still a, a very soft uh, word for my feelings. <laughs> but I just felt when I read when I read the characters specifically, I'm like, these characters don't make the kinds of decisions that I have understood they would do. In the scenarios that they're in um yeah in the beginning of jedi search i'm like where's mara jade like i didn't understand wh where is she because you know i came out of basically the throne trilogy last line in the book i still remember is hold on i'm coming with you which to me means mara jade will now accompany luke skywalker to um you know to to find new students to rebuild the praxium then of course dark empire happens and i'm like I don't I'm not a bit big fan of Dark Empire, but I'm like the Jedi Academy trilogy is where Dark Empire needs to be addressed, specifically for Mara Jade and Luke Skywalker together. Like Palpatine came back and Luke fell to the dark side. That's a, a pretty big deal. And I'd like to see Mara Jade comment on that. And then it just didn't happen because she was to me written out of the story basically until End of Thrawn. Like she had no relevant part in any bigger event um and I, I was kind of confused by that because the way i saw her arc in the throne trilogy end promised to me like okay she's a part of this now yeah and she wasn't and like i i don't like this and the things <laughs> that they did do with her like try to force her into a romance with lando or make her a smuggler again which like yeah preneur whatever she was supposed to be i'm like i i see this as kind of a retcon of what she went through because like she kind of just doesn't want to kill luke and that's all that remains of her arc and and yeah that like the beginning point of all that happening i guess were the kevin j anderson novels like if you go through the timeline and so yeah my opinions of him were just kind of negative then of course, uh, as as I understand, at least Kevin J. Anderson also kind of brought Barbara Hampley into the EU as an author. <laughs> I have my opinions about her books and the Callista trilogy, you know, the trilogy that follows. and As well yeah. as the amazing, greatest short story of all time. The only thing that could have been better than the Tion <laughs> short story with uh, Murder and Slush Time. Murder and slush time, damn that that was a that was an experience to make. Yeah, I, I we read this and we spoke about it, and yeah, it was surreal to comment on it. Uh, I should say, but yeah, that's I, I guess my first experience actually with him was Tales of the Jedi because I read that far before I read any of his books, 
And I guess my experience there was mostly positive. Um, while, you know, the, the prequel series to Tales of the Jedi, I guess, is not that memorable, but I didn't hate it. Um, Redemption, I mostly like, though I have my problems with specifically Yulik's death. Yeah. And yeah, so I, I guess I, I just didn't know a lot about him and what, what to expect. But yeah, books so far have been uh, pretty negative. I, I very much hate the JAT. I'm not the, a big fan of Darksaber. And right now I'm reading through Young Jedi Knights. And yeah, it's just kind of continued on, um, you know, my, my opinion about him. Now, I Jedi healed some of the transgressions for you of the Jedi Academy trilogy. Mm -hmm. So, what was your experience like with I Jedi? Were you expecting uh, the kind of like a, a kind of a fourth book of the Jedi Academy trilogy? You know, it's it's right there for a lot of it. Yeah. Um, were you expecting to not like it? Like uh, it was going to fall into like uh, your opinion? for the Jedi Academy trilogy. And were you surprised when you found out that uh, it kind of uh, writes some wrongs that you had and is, is a better story? No, actually I, I very much expected to like it because you know, I'm, I'm usually not someone who cares that much about like spoilers. So when I, in the beginning, before I decided to read everything, just research, like what am I going to read in the EU? I heard about this, like there's the Jedi Academy trilogy and people don't like it for those reasons. And those who don't like these things, they usually then like I Jedi, which reframes a lot of the things. And, you know, when I just got that basic information of, okay, here's these things, they get changed in that way. I was like, okay, yeah, I, I like that version more, the I Jedi version. So I expected to like it. And when I read it, I, I did very much enjoy it. Um, Mostly how it fixes, uh, I guess, just the position of Mara Jade as a character in this universe, the the establishment of the Jedi Praxium and why they even like stayed on the planet, why they just didn't go away, you know, because yeah. there's this big dark threat. You have a bunch of uh, malleable students there who don't know how to fight Exar Kun. How would they? And you're just kind of standing there um, and remaining on on the moon when there's really no reason to and i jedi th the thing with i jedi was it, it can't just like actually rewrite what's happening because to me you know a lot of the things that logically would have needed to happen didn't and you can't just say okay there's a dark side presence on yavin 4 luke notices it and then he's like okay let's go away this is dangerous like, no, that, that's in the story now. You can't just change it um, and, and rewrite it. So a lot of the problems I had with I Jedi to me in the first half were like, okay, this is things that you have to take over from the Jedi Academy trilogy, and, uh, and that's it. So I definitely liked that. And I also, like, on an even more simpler level, I like just that the book portrayed, like, a training session like, Khan Solyasa was there in the book, which is a big plus from the Jedi Academy trilogy, because my understanding was that, you know, Kevin J. Anderson and Tom Beach worked together a lot, I mean, Tales of the Jedi specifically, so you would expect that things from his story would naturally translate over into, into the JAT, and Khan Solyasa as a character was like, where is he? He's the most experienced guy out of all of you. You would think that he's there to, like, train the next generation but he just wasn't in the jat and then in ijedi you see him like oh no he's actually here he like has sparring sessions and he's teaching uh the new students like about you know the the rings of defense like there's actually lore to lightsaber battle and to the usage of the force and all of that i was like mm -hmm. this is kind of what i expected from a jedi academy trilogy to like read how do you fight what do you do how do you use the force and how does it work? That's kind of what I wanted. And I I got it in that book um, with all the holdover problems I had. But still, I, that was the reason why I had very good time with the book in general. Do you think that the Jedi Academy trilogy and I Jedi work together well um, as like a, an overall story between them? They, 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 
complement each other in some ways? I I do. Um, usually people say like I, I've seen people say like you know I Jedi maybe disrespects the Jedi Academy trilogy because of course it's obvious a lot of the things that you read in that book are very clearly just ways to rewrite things that are not established but implied in the Jedi Academy trilogy. So let's say that, you know the possibility of Mara and Lando becoming a couple or like things about why uh, why are the Jedi still in Yavin 4. Like there is there is clearly attempts to kind of retcon the implications of the Jedi Academy trilogy. But I actually think it gives a lot of more scenes that um arguably the JAT should have had. Let's say, mm-hmm. you know, Gantorus, when Gantorus dies in the Jedi Academy trilogy, it's kind of just brushed off. Like I remember Luke saying, beware of the dark side to his students as they find up like like find his shriveled, burnt up corpse in, in his room. Yeah. And in, in I Jedi, you actually have like a funeral for Gantorus. I'm like, yeah, th- this this should have been in the actual book. Like, this is what what I've been missing. Like, focus on the Jedi characters. It's fine. You, if you want to have like a Dala or a Morith Duel or whatever, have them in other other books if you must. But that's what Jedi Academy stories should be about. So I would definitely say it gives a lot more just context, a lot more scenes to make the original story not that like horrible in my opinion yeah yeah uh you mentioned some comic books as well uh you mentioned tales of the jedi and dark empire Mm -hmm. uh what's your comic book experience been like so far within the expanded universe do you like uh the comics that you've read uh are there any standouts uh do you like that form of medium for star wars stories to be told i have definitely warmed up more to the medium uh kind of helps that I've started also just reading normal, I guess, superhero comic books, because I, for most of my life, didn't read any comics at all. Um, Overall, I haven't read all too many comics. Um, It's mostly been like, you know, smaller story arcs that kind of fit in with some books, I guess. Um, Like Leviathan we read because, I mean, at some point you have to read Leviathan. And when are you going to do that? I read... Tales of the Jedi, which uh, I would still say I mostly enjoyed. It's just been a while since I've read it. I've read Dark Empire, which I don't like, but I don't hate it as well. It's just I, I think some you know story aspects and some like lore aspects don't really work there, but I, I'm not that negative about them. I've read a bit of Republic. I, I don't remember how far along I was. In the Republic comics, I'd definitely have to. If I eventually reread them, which I will, I will read everything. But I remember liking them. Yeah. And Crimson Empire, I think, still is my favorite comic. So I read, nice. I read all three of them. I think they got progressively worse. So yeah. one, one being the best, two still being good but weaker, and three just not being that good anymore. Um, Crimson Empire 1 was definitely my favorite experience so far. Yeah, other than that, I haven't read that many comics, actually. Um, they're mostly, you know, in eras that I'm not in right now, let's say. Dark yeah. Times, Republic, KOTOR, that's where the bulk of comic book stories are, and I'm just not reading in that era right now, so that's why I mostly haven't read comics. Nice. Well, it, it sounds like uh, you're you're uh, dipping your toes into the comics a little bit there, but mm-hmm. uh, kind of focusing on the books right now. And yeah. another medium uh, for Star Wars storytelling is, you know, the young readers novels, the mm-hmm. books aimed at kids. Uh, and you tackled uh, Junior Jedi Knights and Young yeah. Jedi Knights. How do they stack up so far? You've not finished Young Jedi Knights, but how do they stack up against each other? Uh, I, I have a feeling I know which one you'll <laughs> point to as your favorite but uh yeah how do junior jedi knights and young jedi knights stack up uh against each other for you yeah so i i would of course definitely say that uh junior jedi knights is first of all it's it's just excellent as as a not even as a young adult or like junior series but just as books these these books actually you know have a lot of quality in them 
and I would have no problem um, comparing them to like even adult books because I think a lot of the the character developments, the general um, story elements, also the aspects of the force that get talked about there, I think yes. they hold up against even adult books which don't do as well a job as they did. And yeah, compared to Young Jedi Knights, I definitely enjoyed Junior Jedi Knights more. It's it's a tighter read. It's more focused. Um, you know, just in general, it, it it seems more like a book about becoming, I mean, becoming adults kind of, or like becoming teenagers, I guess, but also mm. about becoming Jedi. Because yes. you get more direct explanations like, you know, we do this in training. Now we have this force thing that we're going to learn about. Um, whereas Young Jenna Knights so far is just, it, it's a bit all over the place. You have these books like, let's say, The Lost Ones, where there's like not a single training session, not a single lesson learned. It's just a story on Coruscant that happens to have Jaina and Jason in them. Like, th this is not what should be in this book. You can make this if you want to another book series but it kind of doesn't once again like the same way i felt about the jedi academy trilogy it just doesn't fit with the kind of story that you should tell if you have that name like it it, it just implies a different story so junior jedi knights i would definitely say to me ranks above young jedi knights but also above a lot of other adult books i mean uh we talked like 10 hours in total or something about all all the junior yeah. jedi knights books uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there, and it's uh, noteworthy, and you should definitely read it and not dismiss it as like junior novel, not that important. No, it's fantastic, actually. Were you surprised uh, that you found the young reader stuff to have uh, such good quality there? A lot of people said that Junior Jedi Knights was that excellent, but yeah, I guess I was surprised how how great it actually was because you kind of expect, okay, some things are going to be more juvenile if you read mm -hmm. them. And I kind of waited for that moment to be like, ah, this is this is such a moment. But it, it never happened. I was like, yeah, I'm reading this and it's good, it's good, it's good. And oh, it's it's finished already. Like it, it was just very good. So yeah, yeah, I, I was surprised kind of you could say because young adult immediately like you, you think about, you know, specific things that you wouldn't cover like you don't go in depth about all logical problems maybe because it's for children it's for teenagers but yeah this this book did a fantastic job of just telling a good story and not you know not having to hide behind like oh it's just young adult yeah, yeah. so as you're continuing your expanded universe journey um what are some books that you anticipate uh, the most? What What's some stuff that you're really looking forward to reading uh, that's upcoming on your schedule? What am I looking forward to? I think um, because I expect to really, really like them, it's probably going to be uh, Dark Tide. Yeah. Uh, so the, the New Jedi Order duology, it's going to be... Oh god, I, I forgot the English titles. The uh, the Greg Keyes books. Um, Edge of Victory. Edge of Victory. I, I expect to really, really love them. And Traitor and Unifying Force. I guess that's kind of just from way most from the way most people speak about those stories. I think I'm gonna have my greatest experience with them. Um, yeah, that that that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. I guess other than that. Yeah, maybe like just the occasional reread that I'm gonna have, like for you know some prequel era books that I really thought were fantastic, but those are like way in the future, so they're not even on my mind right now. I would say like New Jedi, otherwise probably those books. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, have you have you tried to avoid spoilers, or do you pretty much know a lot of the uh, plot points to those upcoming uh, stories? With New Jedi Order, I kind of managed to avoid a lot about like the actual story. However, I, I do know, I mean, I know the very prolific death in Vector Prime. I know the prolific death from um, Star by Star. So, I, you know, I, I know that people die there and who it is. So, 
I've kind of, you know, picked up on a few things, but most of, you know, most of the like things that people praise, I guess, I actually am not aware of. So, you know, what exactly is happening in Traitor or what is un the unifying force in the context of the last book? I actually don't know anything about that. So whereas with other books, I know kind of what to expect. That's actually something I'm pretty um, ignorant about for now. Which is good because I mean I'm I'm so close to reading them now. Um yeah, there's no reason to to get spoiled at this point. Yeah. Absolutely. That's that's great. I'm really excited to hear your thoughts as you're gonna be delving into NJO with Pico uh yeah. in the in the coming months and years. Well, probably just months. But uh <laughs> you also mentioned that Edge of Victory had a had a, a different title. What what's its title in German? Oh god, uh all new Jedi Order books have uh weird titles wait i'm gonna have to very quickly look them up because none of the none of the translations actually you know uh match up with the english ones that's interesting like bantam era books usually kind of match but uh in this case it just doesn't and i i don't understand why so wait i found them here book seven and eight that's edge of victory right yeah so book seven is like directly translated into English, Anakin and the Yuzan Vong. <laughs> and book eight, I, I don't even know what that word would be in German way. <laughs> in, in English, sorry, I'm gonna have to quickly the promise, I guess, would be the translation. Yeah, <laughs> the promise. Oh wow. Uh, yeah. So New Jedi Order, you know, whenever we start like a stream, we always just talk about the titles and if they make sense. In regards to the story that the that the book tells, that's how we yep. talked about. Let's say the Jedi Academy trilogy. Does it make sense that their names and all of that? And I always also bring up the German names. Usually, it's uninteresting because it's the identical name. But yeah, New Jedi Order is going to be interesting because like all of them are basically different, other than a few. Like Traitor is the same, Unifying Force is basically the same. But yeah, some of them are weirdly different yeah so as you've been going through uh these books in these long long uh stream reviews with the mm -hmm. jaded talk um what inspired you uh to, to to start your youtube channel uh what was your goals uh and uh what why did you want to talk about the star wars expanding universe on youtube and uh how, how's that been going uh, are you enjoying that and what are uh, future plans for the channel? So what initially inspired me, I guess, was just me having a lot of thoughts about the book I was currently reading. I I noticed it around the time I think I read Court of Princess Leia because I, I really very much didn't enjoy the book. And most people I know at least tolerate it or actually really like it. And so yeah. I was kind of having back and forth with people a lot about the book. And that's when I just, I guess, kind of thought, huh, I, I got to write down more stuff about the book just to have them in mind when I want to speak about them. And then when I started reading Jedi Search, I, I just noticed like every chapter I was reading, like there is something I need to say, like here's <laughs> something that I think is good or doesn't make sense and is not good. And that's just kind of, I guess, how I got into having like chapter reviews or like chapter summaries because i'm like if something is really good you're gonna have to say something about every chapter and if something is really bad also like because something is happening in these pages and i guess that that was just kind of the initial like starting point of me speaking about them in that format and then uh, it was um you know i'm uh, i'm a lot with i, I was a lot on like noah's um, YouTube channel quality autism and I think he just had like a normal gaming live stream and that's when I when I was on there as well like for the first time and where while he was playing we just kind of spoke about some stories that I liked and disliked and that's I guess what gave me the idea of hey I'm, I might as well like talk about the books in that format just have my notes uh, ready basically read them off more or less and have a conversation about the book and yeah, when I finished Jedi Search, that was then my like 
initial live stream. I had Jedi search. I had a couple of people from Discord server on, and we just talked about, I guess, the book, what, what I had to expect going forward. I was still relatively naive about a lot of EU things when I read uh, when I read the Jedi Academy trilogy. So I had a bunch of people on who, who knew a lot more than I did. And it was, I guess, just kind of fun. And that's basically my only goal with the channel. Like, I think right now I have something like 50 subscribers. It, it's not like I'm doing this for for big fame or something. I'm just just going on, on YouTube, basically having like a, a hangout talk with a couple of guys I like and just talk about... Um, yeah, book club. Uh, yeah, essentially, I'm just talking about the book like I would if I were just in a in, vo in a voice chat on on Discord. The only difference is it's on YouTube, and I'd say so far it's like really fun. It, it definitely is a lot of fun. Specifically, um, when when Pico started joining was I think Champions of the Force when he yeah. was on for the first time, and since then he's basically become uh, basically his whole... channel as well. <laughs> yeah, like more or less, he's he's. Therefore, basically every live stream, save for like one and two, one or two maybe, uh, he's always there. And it's we kind of have, I guess, the same value system when it comes to stories, and that's why we um, bounce off each other very well with our talking points, I guess. And yeah, um, sometimes I've almost felt like burnt out because I, I felt like I needed to read more quickly to get the coverage out. Uh, because like, right in the beginning, I managed to do you know weekly live streams and like finish a book per week, uh, because that's when I had actually a lot of time to to do that. But now I'm like, I'm a bit more chill with that. I recognize okay, it, it's fine to do other things and not to have to worry about these uh, like some schedules that I made up for myself. <laughs> yeah, There's no necessity for that. I'm a ju just a dude speaking into a microphone about some star wars book and yeah that, that that's really it my goal is just to at least speak about every eu story that's mildly important i'd say once and if i manage to do that that's going to be great if i don't uh that's also fine because yeah that that's really all the motivation i have for that well it's it's really fun i've thrown on a lot of them and listened through a lot of them uh i especially love um even though i enjoy the jedi academy trilogy <laughs> I, I i have to confess i quite like the kja beat downs a little bit uh they're, they're very entertaining uh, and you and pico have great energy and it's uh always fun to hear those discussions um something else that you've talked about uh on your channel before is uh kind of thoughts on expanding universe continuation Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you you kind of cast doubt upon uh, if you think that's a good idea. So uh, what are your thoughts there? Um, pretty easy, actually. If, if somebody were to ask me, do you think that you should be continued? My answer would be yes, but. So yeah. um, I, I don't mind, in general, the you being continued in some way. My, my, my doubts are just about the Lucasfilm we have today, I guess, because I, th I think a lot of EU continuation is obviously reliant on the authors you have at your disposal. And yeah. sure, for now, you still have Timothy Zahn or Michael Stackpole, or I, I, I think Lucino is basically retired already, but he's still around. Matthew Stover is still around. So sure, in theory, all these authors could still write. But yeah, at some point, they won't be able to to write anymore. And you're going to yeah. have to think about if you still want the EU to continue after the fact, who else is going to write them? Like, who else is going to write the new books and the new comics? And to me, the most obvious answer to that is, well, it's going to be the people who write Star Wars books and comics at the moment. It's mm -hmm. going to be people like Chuck Wendig and Sam X and whatever. And I'm sure everyone who is listening to this has some opinions about these people. Um, <laughs> and, and that's just my worry with it. I'm like, I, I, I'm not sure if we want to see that. And because that's also what people then mention, like, hey, you don't need to read them. If you think you're not going to like them, why, why do you care? Well, because I believe that 
if you have a big timeline like the EU, the worth of the timeline is determined by all, you know, the, the worth of all the individual works. Yeah. If you have a negative work in your timeline, it's going to devalue the product as a whole. Like, let's yeah. say, you, you know, I think the Jedi Academy trilogy is bad. Well, it's a centerpiece of the Bantam era, if I, whether I like it or not. It's determined basically the, the, the pathway through the entire era until the end in, in Hand of Thrawn. And yeah, that, that's something that's something I accept. I'm like, yeah, okay. I mean, it's part of the timeline. But to me, it makes the timeline a bit less worth, like a, a bit less valuable, I guess, mm. than if the story A little were tarnished. Yeah. And, you know, maybe you don't agree that the Jedi Academy trilogy is such a story, but everyone has some story where they're like, this is really shit. And yep. if there were a better book in place, uh, it would have been better overall. And that's kind of my idea. It's like if you add bad books, doesn't matter if I read them or not, you're devaluing the EU as a whole. Absolutely. And you might as well just be like, hey, you know, the thing we have, it's not perfect. It has a lot of significant flaws, but overall people are gonna memorize it as an as a positive experience. You mm. might as well just leave it that way because the likelihood that you're gonna have people there who won't have you know a high degree of quality output is very very high in my opinion and that's just kind of my position like i, I don't care too much if it like if, if it's going to continue then sure it will if it's not then it won't but yeah i'm like it, better just leave it that way you're inviting problems that are going to happen more or less definitively so yeah that that's really my position on that i mean best case scenario we get a full continuation just by kevin j anderson <laughs> of course yeah he's still around as well true <laughs> yeah we could we could just bring him back and he could rewrite i jedi sure sure we could be open to that it's gotta be fun yeah <laughs> <laughs> it would certainly be intriguing at the very least <laughs> well yeah that, that's true i guess yeah it, it, and it would give you something to rant about for like an eight hour stream yeah, I mean, maybe maybe that's got to be what uh, what keeps me motivated to have a content output is more Kevin J. Anderson novels. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you for taking the time uh, to talk about the expanding universe a bit with me today. Uh, I really liked hearing your thoughts on uh, a lot of these different topics. Uh, for those of you watching, uh, make sure to go and check out Jade Light's channel and check out uh the jaded talk uh now it, just so uh the viewers know uh a lot of them are live so go to the live tab uh for finding all of them they're not all of them are in the videos tab uh the majority of them are live streams so uh make sure to check out uh jade lights uh jaded talk series uh, it'll be linked in the description and thanks for joining me for this today man it was great to have you on thanks for having me it was definitely a lot of fun it was great yeah and we'll have to do it again sometime in the future. I agree, definitely, yeah. Uh, I've, I've got to hear your new Jedi Order thoughts as you're going through that, you know? Yeah, they are just barely, almost in my grasp. I'm so close, yeah. So very yeah, soon. They're within sight, yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, thank you to the viewers for watching, and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. See ya, bye-bye.